Well, hello, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen around the world. It is once again time for the Wadcast, episode number 55. I am one of your hosts, Josh, as always, joined by the guy that just can't seem to uh, make it to the show on time. Hi, everybody. It's the Wadcast. I guess I forgot to unmute the mics for the Facebook feed. It's Whoops. okay. Are we actually showing our faces today? I am. I don't know wow. about you. Well, I'm not ashamed to. Mine's a little blurry, though. I don't know what's up with that. Sure. You know what? For solidarity, since yeah. this way everyone knows what we both look like. Yep. Here we go. Holy cow. Look, it's the guy. It's the guy from the show. <laughs> it's the guy. Oh, man. What's yeah, this up, is, uh, I think, the very first episode we've actually uh, decided to show our faces to the world. I wish my camera was cooperating a little bit. It's fuzzy. Yeah, I wish your camera was, I wish your camera was uh, cooperating, too. <sighs> so, what's up, man? Not much. Just, uh, you know. Hanging out here. I had a minute that we were going to be going live. I would have gone down to like a waterfront or something like that. Something a little bit more fancy. What else do we do on a Friday night? Well, I'm just saying, like, I mean, you know, California. I'm thinking, like, it's still sunny outside right now, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just instead I'm just hanging out here in, uh, you know, the not waterfront. But it's okay. Yeah, ever, ladies and gentlemen, this is about how our show works. This whole opening section here is the epitome of what defines our show, which is zero planning and zero awareness of what the other person is thinking. So <laughs> imagine how far we'd go if we actually decided to try to start planning stuff out. And even when we start planning things out, it never really pans out. So <laughs> on, on, on the plus side... If things did go accordingly, uh, everyone that was watching on Facebook Live actually got to hear the theme and see a little intro video uh, for the episode. So fingers crossed that worked. <laughs> God. Well, I say we did the whole video thing um, from now on. Fine, fine. I'll, uh, I'll so have to see the, uh, this is a, decks, this I is guess. the closest I get to seeing your face. So this is true. This is true. Yeah. Um, well, here we are. It's the Wandcast episode number fifty-five. We've been doing. We've done this fifty-four times, and now fifty-five. Uh, we have. Yeah. Our what, show is officially uh, middle-aged right now. That's middle-aged. Well, it's been middle-aged for a minute, so it's been middle-aged for a few weeks. <laughs> So it's time for the show to have a, a little uh, red sports car and a twenty-year-old. Well, I mean, I, I've got like, I, I mean, I've got a red car. It's not a sports car, but you know. And I guess I'm gonna I... have to take the twenty-year-old. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> we're both at the age where we don't care what we drive. For Christ's sake, you have a Prius and I have a Volkswagen Jetta. So I mean, it's not exactly and like we're out there trying to pick up chicks. Well. Uh, I technically, I guess I'm the only one that, you know, doesn't have, um, someone. Oh, I just bummed myself out. (laughs) And now I'm sad. (laughs) If only we had the... 
capabilities in the show to have like I guess it would all be post editing, but to have like this little black and white picture of you and the camera slowly zooms in and then uh single tier. We just hear violin music, really sad music. And Anna halfway to syndication if it was on TV. <laughs> no, it, because of my mouth, we will never go anywhere with the show. Um <laughs> HBO. HBO. It would have to be cable, but it has to be premium cable. <laughs> it's not TV. <laughs> oh man. Well, I mean, I, I went back and I listened to the first episode the other day, and I still cannot <laughs> stop cringing at myself. <laughs> I revisit once in a while. Like if I get like too egotistical, if I get too full of myself with any walk of life, I can always go back and listen to that first episode. I'm not proud of it. <laughs> we we can say we've gotten better since then. Uh, I I've improved a little bit, not uh, not 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 much. We haven't but, mentioned you know, kind anything of... about wads and things happening and ears. Yeah, and being uh, projectiled into someone's ears. Yeah, you're right. We haven't really mentioned any of that in quite some time. So uh, not since episode one. Step up. So, uh, Anna, is, so this, God, <laughs> so positive thinking then. <laughs> Don't patronize me. <laughs> so, Brandon, um, now that we have the pleasant trees out of the way, let's get down to business. What are we talking about tonight? Uh, tonight we are discussing 55. world building in uh, writing or just in movies in general. I'm not too, like, again, this goes back to our communication. Um, and this is mostly on me this past week. Uh, but uh, world building and uh, storytelling and stuff like that, people that have to build every movie, every script, uh, whether the script is produced or not, always has a, um, you know, a world uh, built around the characters. And the world itself also can act as a story inside the story. So, I mean... Uh, visual examples, uh, Inception. Inception is a, uh, you know, it, it's an amazing way to tell a story with a world inside of a world. Uh, yeah. The whole setting, uh, just like the whole dream world and everything. Well, Christ, dream world, Nightmare on Elm Street has an amazing world. <laughs> I'm your boyfriend now, bitch. But um, <laughs> uh, it's not the F word, so it's still PG. Um <laughs> 13. But yeah, that to my understanding, um, in our complete lack of communication and uh, thorough planning, I'm, I'm under the impression that's what our show is about tonight, about world building inside of scripts and how they're conducive to the overall success of your story. Did that sound intelligent? Yeah, I just thought of two words uh, for the show. Um, okay. Certainly put in a lot more thought than I did. Okay, no, that's not that's not the, that's not the case. I, I was thinking we would talk about because there are writers that maybe maybe they don't necessarily feel like they need to build the world that the characters live in. Uh, some yeah. of them take for granted that oh, it's just the world, you know, the world that we live in. But even if that's the case, you kind of have to establish that it is the world we live in. There are certain things that, you know, you should throw in there, things that the character's going to do, places that they're going to be. Say, you know, you're, you're writing a story set in New York City. Well, there's a certain... There's a, a certain... Characteristic... Of, yeah. of New York City that you kind of have to throw into all, you know, real world New York City scenarios. Yep. And yeah, the Ghostbusters firehouse is one of them, Hook and Ladder 88. Like, it needs to be in there. Always. Every New York movie has to have it. Yeah. And Game better. <laughs> when you establish the rules of the world, when you establish you know, some of the technology of the world. It really helps develop a sense of depth to your stories. 
Yep. Uh, look at what's something that takes place in the near future that I can pull from. Or no, the you Jetsons. Know <laughs> you know, actually, technically, that is the near future. Uh, and I mean, and also Terminator uh, is coming up. Judgment Day. So, I mean, it's it, well. I mean, who the hell knows? It's always being postponed. It's got to. It's got to. It needs to get its shit together. Yeah, that, that date's always getting pushed around. Um, yeah, I know. It, it's it's like uh, it's like uh, you know, Skynet can't decide when it wants to get married. I don't know. It's always being postponed. But if you want to take uh, Terminator as an example, they set up the rules for their world. There's. Uh, companies right you'll see their logos scattered throughout uh there's time travel involved so you have to not necessarily iron out every little detail about the time travel but you have to have an idea of what the rules are yeah otherwise and this might sound a little nitpicky but Quite frankly, if you haven't been on the internet, you might realize that there are some people out there that absolutely love to pick apart your movies. Oh, yeah. And they get a kick out of it. And I believe that there are some that are, shall we say, sadistic enough to take pleasure in the making writers absolutely miserable because they just do nothing but point out the plot holes and the inconsistencies and the the tiniest uh, and sometimes huge uh, details that will tear your story apart because it doesn't make any sense. There was yeah. one case in particular that, you know, I'm going to throw this comment up here because um, that is true. Absolutely. Trolls and haters. <laughs> maybe maybe you could say he was a very high profile troll but Neil deGrasse Tyson took James Cameron to oh yeah <laughs> Titanic James Cameron, right <laughs> yeah James Cameron the guy that spent millions upon millions upon millions of dollars to make sure and years and years of research years and research research <laughs> to get to get the china patterns right to get the silverware right, to get, you know, the draperies oh, and the uniforms and everything just exquisitely <laughs> perfect to recreate the Titanic. And uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, I don't remember exactly what he said, so I'm going to paraphrase. Oh. He was like, you know, with all that money spent on making the Titanic look good, you think he might take five minutes to figure out what the sky looked like. Excuse so, yes. me, I'm listening. The astrophysicist <laughs> called out uh, James Cameron for having the wrong stars in the sky for that particular night. So there yeah. is always going to be someone that notices, um, no matter how perfect you are. And, you know, that's the same, and this is really a topic for a different oh. time, but I'm just going to say that every movie has plot holes. There's no such thing as a, as a perfectly seamless movie there are the movies that you you know overlook a, a few inconsistencies maybe they're yeah. not so big maybe uh, it doesn't really affect the story but you're like you know what I didn't even notice because I was too enthralled with the story I was too enthralled and I was too too much um, I was living in this world that was built for me an audience yep. member and that is why, one of the many reasons why world building is so important. Do you think, do you think Harry Potter, to use um, an example, Harry Potter would be half as recognizable as, as it is if it wasn't for um, just... All of the little details that were put into building the world, uh, from the stores to the lore behind, you know, uh, getting a wand of all things. You know, you could have just said, okay, they're going to go to the store and get a wand. But no, no, that became a whole thing, right? Uh, uh, she could have said, you know what? 
to get to Hogwarts, you just hop on the train. Technically true, but um, there was that one little step of running through a wall that yep. immensely added to uh, the world to, to not, not necessarily make it more believable because I think the better you are at world building, the less believable it has to be and the more people will just buy into it. Star Trek, another another brilliant example of world building. Um, I don't think people are watching because it's realistic. I think people love the world that was created. The world without money. Uh, the the world that in real life has not only Starfleet Academy training manuals, but blueprints for the ships and a a language Klingon that is actually a few languages. A, a few languages that are that are actually taught at universities as foreign languages. It is one of the epitomes of world building in in television and film, and it's it's barely even breaking uh, through the amount of effort it takes to create a massive world that will fully engulf you, and that. That is how fandoms are born. When you have yeah. these worlds that you just want to be a part of because the little details were fleshed out. Even Kevin Smith. Maybe you've heard of him. Oh yeah. The whole of USQ thing. Like I mean, like you know, that whole like everything that he did. Even even just from out of necessity, right? Not being able to use certain name brands. Um Next thing you know, you got fans that are clamoring for a pack of nails cigarettes, a, a brand that doesn't <laughs> exist. But people are like, that is cool. It's part of the world building. I want a piece of it. I myself, in case you're wondering what I want for Christmas, have been dying to get my hands on a movie's uh, in, a fun employee shirt. Because I think it would just be rad. Yeah, I have one. Ah, oh, God, I hate you. Yeah, I got one from the movie shop in uh, downtown LA when they were open out here. See, I had no no idea that that stuff was. Yep, I ate at a movies. I had a moo milk shake, a cow tipper. Yeah, I had those, Josh. And you didn't. I go hiking where he goes hiking over at Runyon Canyon. You don't. <laughs> I don't go hiking anywhere. Look at me. Well, I'm telling you, you need to come out, get your ass out to Los Angeles, and uh, do a little visitation. Well, that's for but, uh, people with money to go coast to coast, man. Just hit, no, I don't know, hitchhike. Uh, like you've seen action movies, all you have to do is just run up and grab a hold of like a plane's tire before it takes off, and you're you're good. You know, if free movies, national travel. If movies have taught me anything, it's that it's entirely plausible to do that, as long as it's not Tom Hanks traveling, because then you're just screwed. You know, I mean, it's just it's bad. But uh, no, you know what, um, and Anna, I'm sorry that we're not uh, responding to you. With uh, I wanted to get let Josh get through his uh, thought there. But uh, Anna, thank you very much for your constant like interaction here. I really do appreciate it. Um, but uh, yeah, way to rub it in. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I mean, uh, she says this. Um, she makes a point here when you're talking about Star Trek that like I mean, it's been going on since the '60s. Uh, this is a show that is you know approaching. 60 years old um and so with that the fan base has just much like star wars 
you know, the one thing you didn't mention was Star Wars. You mentioned Star Trek, so I know where your allegiance is lie, but it, it's cool. Um, it's true. Yep. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't think that they have, uh, you know, I don't think that, like, Tuscan Raider is a language that's taught in any linguistics class whatsoever in any college. I, I would crack the hell up if it was. You know, just like, you sound like a bunch of circus seals when you're talking to each other. I would love that class. But, um, you know, it's, it's the worlds that these movies uh, build. And then you have the movies that don't really build those worlds. I'll always go back to this movie to talk about how bad it is. Uh, the Room with Tommy Wiseau. It is great for the worst of reasons. There is no world. Uh, it's just, it's... The most you see of the outside world, I think, is when he's picking up flowers from that flower shop, and I think that's really it. Everything else is filmed in, like, a back alley or in, like, a really badly made set. But there's no world there. There's nothing. I beg to differ. I beg to not differ. There is, like... (laughs) There are some rules that are set. For instance, to play football in... in the world of the room it just in involves throwing, <laughs> throwing a football back and forth in tuxedos and the most soft football throw you could ever do like the whole go long <laughs> in that world mood swings are not um optional they are mandatory <laughs> Oh God! Oh, that movie. Oh, I can't. I so you know there is her. a movie. Oh, I'm Mark. <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> do you want to order me a pizza? Do you want me to order a pizza? I don't care what you do. I already ordered a pizza. You're so good to me. Ah, <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> it's just I can't. Oh, so the rules of that oh, world are God. terrible, but they still exist. It's he had a bigger world. He had this like attempt at a sitcom of a bunch of people living in a uh, in like a condominium. I watched every, every episode of it. <laughs> and Tommy Wiseau plays two parts. He plays the uh, manager of this um, high rise. And he also plays this college jock that interacts with the manager in certain scenes, too. And the way he does the college jock is he has a blonde wig that he wears with a leather jacket. That I even think says, like, some kind of high school in the back, but he's in college. Uh, But either way, that had a bigger world than anything I ever saw in the room. I I will say, though, and I'm... um... If you have not seen the room, then you have to watch the room. You don't. You don't have to watch the room. It is, and uh, you do not have to watch the room. Must. It's it's required viewing. You know what? How about this? Watch and watch the room. See, Uh, this is going to be like this is going to be my no. This is the only time I will ever recommend anyone watch the room. If you are having a bad day. And you just really, really, really want to get white girl wasted. Get hammered. Get sloshed. Come down to the case of hammertosis. What you do is you get like two or three handles of your favorite liquor, whatever. Or like two or three cases of your favorite beer. I don't care what you drink. Every single time Tommy Wiseau says, oh, hi, Mark. Or if he starts like doing this whole, ah, you know, like whatever laugh. Like he does like the whole damn movie. You take a shot. Within the first 15 minutes, you're going to be shit-faced. And then you can pass out, and you'll never remember the rest of the movie. I think that's a damn good idea, Josh. Well, if I were, uh, say, 15 years younger, I'd be down. Uh, I would never be down. That is alcohol poisoning. You'll die. (laughs) I tell you, the last... The last actual drinking game that I played involved <laughs> watching South Park bigger, bigger, longer, and uncut. And uh, let's see. <laughs> the idea was to take a shot every time someone swore. 
and <laughs> oh, it did officially become the most profane movie in in history at that point. <laughs> After uh, about twenty doubles, I was tapping out. Uh, listen, this is what it's going to look like if you try to drink when you're watching the room. It opens up. He gets his flowers. He goes in there. He meets his uh, fiance or whatever. Is uh, it's like they have a quick conversation. Oh, <laughs> okay. Five minutes later. Oh, <laughs> okay. Two minutes later. <laughs> like, oh, God damn it! <laughs> Give me shit face. It's like watching Lord of the Rings, and every time someone goes on like a long-winded talk, that's when you take a shot. But, you know, talk about, like, Fantastic Worlds, Lord of the Rings. I hate those movies with a passion. Can't stand them. I think they were the dumbest movies and the most boring movies I could ever sit through. I saw them in the theater. I have not once seen them in their entirety ever since. But I will say that the world, I am familiar with them enough to say that the world that they build the story around is phenomenal. Um, even if it's strayed from the books like it did with the... Uh, prequel trilogy because i don't remember like a battle of five armies i'm pretty sure it ended after they killed smaug um well that's the thing about the hobbit uh they took one book stretched it out over three movies but used a lot of uh short stories as kind of filler yeah i know it's just it's like they did peter jackson did with one book which he usually does with anything and he made it long-winded as hell At least the original um, trilogy that he did seemed to warrant the long-windedness. Uh, yeah, did it, though? As I Randall so. said in Clerks 2, even the trees walked in that movie. <laughs> I think, uh... The yeah, bonus yeah, DVDs? Think... Are you serious? There's bonus DVDs of Lord of the Rings? Don't you know each movie is like 10 hours long? Uh, it feels. I feel like I need to clock in before I start watching them. Yeah, it's a, it's like a full time work week. You know what? Movies. Listen, I work at nights, okay. Um, and people listening, do not take this the wrong way. I work medical. Most of my night is spent sitting at the station waiting for a call light to where I can go check on my patient. Now that being the case, I can still bring in. I think uh, I think I have like a copy or two of uh, like one of like the Lord of, like one or two of the Lord of the Rings. Uh, I think they belong to Daniel because uh, I sure as hell didn't buy them. But uh, and I think that they are actually the bonus DVDs. Come to th- I, I saw a bonus on it, like with additional scenes, which God forbid. When I go to work tonight, I'm going to bring my older laptop that has the DVD player on it. I'm going to put it on mute, and then I'm going to, uh, you know. Just hit play. I'm going to see if I can get through the entire shift tonight. And when I clock out in the morning, I'm curious if these movies will still be playing. My God, Anna, the collector's editions are four DVDs each. Hell to the no. Josh, where are you? There you are. Is the picture any better? Well, yeah, it's better than a blank screen. <laughs> where are my where Where are the kids? Um, there's one. They over have there. not seen. They have not seen Uncle Brandon in a long time. Yeah, I don't think that's gonna uh, change today. <laughs> Wow. Huh, I probably should have picked up before I turned this camera on. Probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, single dad life. What can you do? Well, uh... All right, so let's tell, like, let's go for the... Now, like, these stories. I like, know we've talked about examples of movies that have great stories. Now, what do these stories do for these movies? Um these stories can actually be characters themselves. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. These, these stories, I'm sorry. The, the surrounding the world can be a character in itself. 
uh, looking at uh, Back to the Future, Hill Valley practically is a character in the series of uh, Back to the Future. Like every movie in that uh, trilogy takes place in Hill Valley at some point in time. And the character changes with each movie from like, you know, the present time to the 50s to the like, like what, <laughs> uh, six years ago. And uh, to, um, you know, like uh, the 1800s. And really, the characters are the ones, the main cast are the ones that evolve with this ever changing character. Uh, you have Ghostbusters. Uh, Ghostbusters, of course, the, uh, you know, the main building in Ghostbusters uh, that was created by the architect that was a Gozer, Gozer worshiper. That is a character in itself, and that is its own world. And it creates another world of all the ghosts by channeling the ghosts with it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, Lord of the Rings, each and every movie uh, of that insanely boring series uh, takes place in, like, this world of, you know, Middle Earth. And it's, you know, that whole area, like, it, it it does a lot for the story. It does a lot to enhance the story because in that world you have all the kingdoms. You have, you know, the Shire. You have, like, you know, like, the, like, Smog's Lair in the, uh, I guess, like, I guess that is a kingdom, right? Mm-hmm. But... And Inception. Inception. I look at Inception a lot like, uh, well, I guess similar to uh, Doctor Strange when they're like altering the buildings around and everything else. But Inception with it being like in the dream state and everything else, again, it's like a character in the movie because it is something that they have to work with and interact with. So and Imagine having a title of, of one of your characters, uh, a job title being The Architect, right? And you're yep. not talking about simple, you know, I design buildings. Well, you do, but you're creating the the base of reality for a dream world. You're the one making the the rules for what's going on. And, and, and that's kind of exactly what the writer does, creating yeah. the rules. Uh, that's... It's one of the most beautifully freeing things about being a writer. There are so many times where I will I will think about something that's wrong with the world and come up with this outlandish solution to to solve it or yeah. come up with, you know, these different rules that are like, "Oh, this should be in place. This should be in place." And every time I do, I kind of get disappointed because I know it's not possible. And I'm like, man, I just wish there was some way I could create a world where these were the rules. And then you go, I can't because I'm a writer. Crazy how that works. <laughs> I'm telling so you. You, you, Here, can one build, you can build your utopias. You can build your your perfect dreamscapes. You can create worlds where you get the girl slash guy slash, you know, whatever. You, you can get whatever you want. Um, not all stories have to have problems. I know. It's kind of weird to process. Now, mind you, the, the stories without problems aren't really fun to read as an outsider but for you it should be uh, therapeutic at least right um, yeah and 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 i do believe there is a certain certain line of cinema that is based solely on uh, a world where there are no real problems I'm not sure um, how to put this in in a, in a friendly way, uh, air air friendly way. Well, you can take my one per episode if you want. No, I can't. I'm I'm Good. doing this That's in front of a live studio audience, so. <laughs> so you intend to get famous without me? <laughs> <laughs> What, you didn't know I'll that I never was broadcasting be anything. live on stage? <laughs> I have the camera on me, not on the audience. 
Uh, we'd have to have like a sensor bar for me at all times. But I, I've done pretty good so far. We're like, what, like uh, 35 minutes into the show, and I have not said fuck once. That's my one. You know what? Every time you do what? that... There. What? <laughs> He's just one. <laughs> oh, God. That's good. I like that. <laughs> I'm keeping that on file. But that's then, good. That's actually really good. First time in 55 episodes you pulled that one on me. That's good. <laughs> it just shows that I care by learning new things. <laughs> yeah, Anna, I don't know if you've uh, listened to a few of the other episodes here. Uh, but um, I have a very foul mouth. Very foul mouth. And uh, it used to be much worse. Um, really, really bad. I think I I think I said the F word like every five seconds originally, and I decided to try to take it more seriously. Yeah, you decided. And in doing, huh? Nothing. Hey, I did decide that maybe I should take myself a little bit more seriously. That wasn't a you thing, bitch. Okay, that was a me thing. <laughs> but um, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> love you. But um, but I, I realized how bad my mouth was because I was listening to an episode one day and I was like, oh yeah, this is pretty bad. And it wasn't the first episode. It was, I think, like around like, uh, what, like 15 or 16, something like that, before I decided to start really, I guess, toning it down. So I started to give myself one use of the big no, no F word per episode. And ever since then, me and Josh have had a much nicer relationship where he has not been like rolling his eyes at me, at least. Not that I know of. And, uh, yeah. Well, I guess now you so, know Josh, it's... Huh? Yeah, now... So, are we doing this whole uh, live thing from now on? We can. It's, okay. Uh, it's no problem to me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and do this, though, real quick. Your sarcasm and full force must be scathing. Are you talking about me or Josh? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. A little something for the uh, Facebook watchers. <laughs> Proof that we can be PG-13 with the use of one single F-bomb? Yeah, something like that. See, when you listen to us live, and now I guess now watch us live every Friday night at 10pm Eastern, 7pm Pacific, you will get, you know, visual things uh on the show so sorry for those listening to the audio versions only i know there are quite a few of you um i would you know what not uh not not to uh the, the one that's not josh <laughs> not to go I'm listening. go ahead too much of a tangent here but i was taking a look at some things recently and I, I noticed some surprising facts. Okay. Like what? F for instance, the number two country that listens to us is the United States. Huh. That means we were, we're up to what, like uh, five, uh, five followers now? <laughs> oh, if only. <laughs> <laughs> Six no, with um, Anna, okay. <laughs> our um, Anna, please don't go. <laughs> I will say our number one country for listening to us is good eye, Mike. Oh wow, Australia. We're huge in Australia. All right. <laughs> and I don't know how to feel about this, but number three and four. Um, very, very close, uh, like a 0.7% difference 
Uh, number three is Russia. Okay. So, do svidaniya. And um, <laughs> number four is Israel. I, I didn't mean to say it like that. I promise. It, it just, <laughs> I mean, I, it, it meant to come off as more of a surprise, like Israel. Shalom. Yeah, that was uh, more of like a WTF kind of Israel. <laughs> it just surprised me that you know, our, the the number four, uh, the fourth ranked country on our you know demographics is Israel. Of course, it was just as surprising to see that we're not, you know, uh, getting most of our listeners from the United States either. So, uh, yeah. So we're just welcome to all of our all of our friends from around the world, no matter where you're from. Everybody, you know, has a vested interest in in writing, acting, and directing, and as well as all of the you know spots on set in between. Maybe maybe yeah. that's it. We we are we're popular among a very specific group of Australian gaffers. Like uh, there's there's maybe a group of of a fan club, right? For the Wadcast. They call themselves um the best boys for Wadcasts. Okay. So that that could be it. I don't know. But anyway, back to back to I was going to make a joke. Again. I was going to make a joke about like I was going to ask what's the best boy, but I was going to do it sarcastically, but then I realized that if I were to ask that despite me having worked on numerous film sets, I would have looked like a complete amateur. Like, oh, best boys, I love weddings. But, you know, it was going to be a bad joke anyway, and I decided to not do it because, you know, sometimes, and I will admit this, what is funnier in my head that has me laughing to the point of not being able to breathe and being in tears is funny to no other living person on this planet. So, (laughs) they do it with tape. (laughs) Uh, well, they love, oh, never mind, PG-13. <laughs> yeah, okay. I still won't say it. It was going to be a an ex-girlfriend joke, but I'm actually friends with most of my exes, so I, 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 I can't. Because they do listen to the show. And if I were to make that joke, the one that I am going, that I would be addressing... I guarantee, I guarantee, I guarantee that I would get a phone call from this woman the second the show ended, or even probably during. Wait a second. Because thankfully, Jessica does not comment on here. Otherwise, you know. <laughs> How many of these people have been asking about me? What do you mean? You know what I mean. Talk about my exes? Anybody. Would you like me to put your name? Do you want me to whore you out? Mm -hmm. Uh, You already said I'm being whored out anyway. You're in Jacksonville. There's no way that you cannot be a whore in Jacksonville. No offense to people in Jacksonville. But, you know, (laughs) it's Jacksonville. It's pretty bad. Maybe, and I'm not going to, like, Whoring and Jacksonville have nothing to do with this comment, but you live in Jacksonville, in what is the Australia of the United States. So there's a possibility that that's why we're so big with the Australians. That yeah, could be, could be. Yeah, we're both Jacksonville boys. I just live in Los Angeles, but uh, you know. By the way, I just want to say, uh, you know, as long as I have everybody's here, uh, thank you to Tori, I'm the infectious geek, for having me on the show tonight to talk about cults. That is what one of the reasons Brandon thinks I am a lady of the night. So, you are whoring yourself out to other podcasts, I'll say that. There's no longer any sanctity in our own partnership. You have to, uh, you know, get your jollies off somewhere else, too. I, I just want to throw this out there. You know, I'm running a podcast network and for the network to work there needs to be more than one show 
I mean, I mean, I can't be like CBS and just play CSI. Well, I don't remember getting an invite for these other shows either. Oh, feel free to, to come on any of them. Well, now it doesn't count. Now it doesn't count because I just had to invite myself onto the show. Like, I shouldn't have to invite myself to the party. It should be like, hey, Brandon, you know what? My friends would really like you. You should come hang out. You'd click in really well. Oh, Josh, thank you so much. I appreciate that, buddy. Hey, no problem, Brandon. That's what friends do. That is what friends do. But you, no, you don't do that. Uh uh. No, with me, I'm just over here, like, just let me get close to the camera so you can see this. I'm just over here, like, hand on the glass. I'm sorry, it was a bit presumptuous of me to think that <laughs> doing one show and the research for that, plus it was the uh, the project we're working on <laughs> that you are actually toting on your back almost single handedly, plus I know. your full time medical job, plus your significant other, plus your baby. Ish. Yeah. Oh, you leave him. You leave Indiana Jones alone. He does not take that. I neglect that dog. I'm joking. That's horrible. I'm joking. I don't neglect my dog. I was just joking. Indiana, come here. Plus, come here. all of the random clerks and waiters and homeless people that you encounter on a daily basis. Come on. There we go. I feel bad for saying I neglect them. But yep. Indiana Jones, dude, seriously, your head has like no control. Come on. All right. Now that we've passed the... Um, the so- little spousal dispute... Well, I was going to say the three three quarters of the show mark. Okay. You know, how about you and I? I'm, we've spent a lot of time naming good examples of, you know, worlds that have been built. And we've even named an example or two of worlds that didn't really launch very well. Okay. How about we give some tips on what could help create uh, a good world. Hmm. A place that has a uh, piece of the story. It, it carries the story forward. It has to be like the settings, everything that you write, it has to move the story forward. Um, it has to be something that the characters interact with in some way. You see that in like the best films and the best stories. It doesn't even have to be um like a, a movie. It can just any work of literature. The world itself is something that the characters always interact with. Now, would you say that it would count as interaction if there's something in the background that maybe there's a corporate banner? They don't interact with the banner, or there's a a product or there's something flying with no engine or anything like that. You know, just something that seems passive at the time that puts in the back of your mind one of the rules of the world. Like, say there's someone flying in the background, okay? People fly in this world, and maybe that comes into play later. Okay. Would you Would you say adding little touches that may not pay off immediately. Uh, would that be worth it just to say man flying in the background, just to establish that at some point flying could be a thing for the main character? Depends on the story. There. Like, I mean, it really depends on the story. I mean, <clears throat> Like, you could have had a, uh, you know, there's ways to, I guess, so you're, you're talking about, like, foreshadowing, though. Sort of. But it it's um, also a part of building the world that you're in. Um, showing what the rules of the world are, showing what the boundaries are, and establishing the, the laws of it, you know, if you will. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess, I mean, like, okay, uh, 
Okay, Anna just mentioned Meet the Robinsons, and she's got a good point with that one. The world is very intricate. And there is, I guess, something of what you're talking about in that movie, like, itself. Uh, there is actually, you know, the interaction with, like, the old guy wearing, like, the hat. I, I forget what the connection was um, at first, but it's made clear that he's got some kind of stake in this science fair. Okay? Uh, but... What was that movie that just came out with like all the uh, the family going on a road trip to drop the daughter off at college? Uh, it was on Netflix. The um, um, the Mitchells versus the Machines. That's what it is. There is a line talking about her dependence on technology, and it ultimately turns into her battling her whole family, rather battling technology, but her being the last hope for her family against the technology. So there's uh you know you have these you have these things where I think that you can connect these things into the world uh and I guess kind of there is something like that in a movie but not in the, the only one I can think of is in uh Kickass how it shows the guy in the very beginning standing atop the building dressed up like a superhero he spreads his wings and he leaps off the building and it's just like this beautifully shot scene where you think this guy is going to take off and fly. And ultimately what he does is he falls to his death crashing into a car. <laughs> but it's a world where they mention the idea of superheroes. And then superheroes end up existing and more so into the sequel as well. And that one opening was the perfect way to bring that about. Uh, Zombieland. Zombieland did something like that. How about Demolition Man? Demolition and Demolition Man as well. But it's uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I think there's ways that you can go about it, and ways that you sh that you really should try to avoid it. Uh, Back to the Future, you know, your favorite. Uh, the opening scene with all the clocks on the walls. That told you exactly what this movie had to deal with: time. Yeah. But so, I, I, mean, I was thinking more more along the lines of uh, things that establish uh, the world. The world, yeah. But well, that's what I'm talking about. Time itself, like the whole timeline, is a world in itself. For you know, the Back to the Future movies, the superheroes are pretty much cared. The whole world revolves around the superheroes. A zombie land. The zombies are. It's a zombie world. I mean, that's what it is. Okay, then how about this? Okay. It is something that I did actually um, read up on. Timelines. Not not just for your story, but pre-story, post-story, knowing the history and the future of your world and how the actions of your story change... Um, uh, or, or how they uh, send, cement themselves as part of a solid timeline. And, I, and I'm not saying if you're writing a rom-com or, you know, a legal thriller that you have to go all the way back to, you know, 1748 to create this timeline in history for your characters, but... When it comes to less fantastical aspects of storytelling, when you're kind of setting things in, in you know, quote unquote, the real world, um, okay. Personally, I think it is a good idea to, if only toy around with having that timeline for your for your characters, as, as pre preferably all of them. Um, after all, you took the time to give them life. You might as well take the time to give them lives. You know, what year did they graduate college? What did they go to college? Uh, yeah. Do they know anybody famous? You know, just just backstory. And the more you know the world that your characters live in, the more you know your characters, which means the more likely it is you'll be able to figure out exactly what the right thing or 
you know, wrong thing, depending on what the ethical slash moral dilemma is, uh, going forward, <clears throat> okay, you'll, you'll be able to have informed uh, decision making on what your character needs to do. Uh, it, it can be as simple as, well, he dropped out in 10th grade, so he doesn't know about <clears throat> U.S. history, and that's going to be an important plot point. Whatever. Yeah. Or it could be something as detailed as, well, he was a bottle-fed baby, so he never really felt a human connection, so now he's just a jerk. You know? <laughs> <laughs> However you want to do it. Oh, uh, Every God. character and all of their quirks has an origin somewhere. And if you know what that origin <laughs> is for your characters, for your characters, oh, then you'll be able to you know, actually make more in-depth characters, more more three-dimensional characters that people like me and people like you, Brandon, can actually relate to instead of, I don't know what to do anymore. Oh, hi, Mark. People like me. Wow. Yeah, people like you. And actually, Anna brought up this uh, really good point with the, um, you know, with uh, this movie, uh, you know, Indian Summer, uh, with the lighting uh, that emphasized late summer Canadian foliage and uh, that glow of the memory. You know, that's, come on, that's enough, chill. That's, uh, you know, that's actually a really good point, like things like that. But, uh, you know, there's, uh, what was that, uh, there's a movie I was watching where they went back to their summer camp. Um, this was like the 80s, though. I can't remember the name of the movie, but they went back to like their childhood summer camp. It was like uh, or early '90s, but it was just God. I can't remember the name of it, but um, the whole world was the summer camp, and the world went, you know, back and forth from the you know present to the past. But this camp was, in fact, the world. Wasn't that in Indian Summer? It, 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 there was Indian Summer. There was another movie though that I'm trying to think of. It was like from either the mid 80s to early 90s it was not indian summer i know exactly what indian summer is i love that movie it's an amazing film very uh i don't even want to, i i hate to say that's obscure but unfortunately a lot of people won't really know what indian summer is friday the 13th um huh friday the 13th oh god friday the 13th but yeah i guess technically friday the 13th the camp is very much the world unless you go with jason next or Ernest Jason Takes Manhattan. Huh? <laughs> I was going to say Ernest Goes to Camp. Ernest Goes to Camp. <laughs> oh, God. I wish we could pull up clips and then not get, like, you know, I guess take the volume out of our show because of a copyright infringement. That whole badger scene from Ernest Goes to Camp. I laugh to the point of like tears every time I see that. I'll laugh for like hours. Um, I'll think of it. It's not Indian Summer. Um, I actually watched Indian Summer a few weeks ago. I love that movie. I just I cannot think of this one movie's name. So, but yeah, uh, no. The thing is, is when you write something, every single thing in the script. It has to translate well on the page for the sake of the story. It has to do something with the story. Was it, now um, and then? it has to, huh? Now and then? Maybe. I'm on, I'm on my phone, so I can't really. Uh, if I look at another tab, it'll close itself, then I'll get booted. So, um, you know. Christina Ricci, Demi Moore, Rosie O'Donnell. <laughs> No, 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 no. I know that's one where it shows them as adults and then like goes back to them as kids and everything. Yeah, yeah not that one. So, yep. Yeah. Hi, buddy. See, now it's going to drive me. <laughs> yeah, I can't think of it. This is, this is 
And is it about the summer camp? I think so. It's been years. I have to I have to figure out what it is. Because I thought it was Indian summer, but it's not. Go on. Did it have Bill Paxton in it? Bill Paxton in it. Don't remember. I saw it when I was like a teenager, dude. I I, I don't remember. But but the point is is that when you write something, the uh, environment, the world, everything, it has to work with the story. It has to move the story forward. It has to progress the story. The characters have to be able to interact with it. You know, it, it's got to be one of those things where the, the, the world itself has to be pretty much another character in the script. Mm-hmm. So always, at all times, doesn't matter what it is. And you don't just see it's not only in movies. It's, you know, it's plays, it's television, it's books. I mean, it's you always the world is always might as well be a character in the story. So, I mean, you look at kids. The whole world revolves around, like you know, like a you know, a neglected area. I think it was uh, Brooklyn. If I, I, it's been a long time since I saw kids, but it's you know, like one of the uh, you know, it's it's set in New York City. You know, Dogtown takes place in California, and uh, L.A. Like I mean, it's like it's it had like the world always has to be something that characters can interact with physically. And it has to really do something for the situations that they get into. So I'm going to uh, to bring up a, a graphic real quick, and it okay. is from the good folks at NoFilmSchool.com. Okay. Just some questions you can ask when it comes to uh, creating your world. Where are we? You know, you think that's a uh, a dumb question, but you know what? It's a good question. Where does your story take place? What does the area look like? Is it arid? Is it mountainous? You know, just you, you gotta breathe into your into your writing. Breathe into your world. Uh, what kind of uh, are there dominant cultures we're going to meet? It doesn't matter what. The story is there's always going to be point counterpoint, even if it's just one person in the story. There's going to be uh, some sort of conflict with something, and there's going to be a top and there's going to be a bottom. Uh, who inhabits this world? Is it 100% human? Are you know, and that, dogs? and that's actually a good example. Alien. Or aliens, more so. Uh, but alien, you know, you have the uh, the Stromo. Event Horizon, the whole world was that ship. And the ship itself was a character. Now, I guess, like, sci-fi, it's usually a commonplace thing, though. Because, like, you know, even Avatar. Well, I guess more so James Cameron. Uh, but, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um... Who rules this world? That would, definitely, <laughs> that would definitely have an effect on how your <laughs> character behaves, yes? Yep. Uh, what What is technology like here? Is it the future? Is it the past? You know what? And, and, and let me throw this out there. I know it's not written here, but when it comes to writing futuristic stuff and you want something to happen, Say the Zimbab 5000 d- turns water into gold, whatever, doesn't matter. You don't have to explain how it works. I know a lot of people get caught up in the it's so unbelievable, how will I ever explain how it works? You know what? In the world that you created, the only thing that matters is. You say it works. And it, there, there are some people that take this... Uh, I know some writers have called it a cop-out, but I, I actually 
uh, enjoy this explanation very much. When someone's like, how does that work? And the other guy's like, I don't know. It just does. Yeah. That's it. That's all. That's, that's all you have to do. Yeah, like I mean, like yeah, you know, and there's a few movies, like there's a few movies that you can see that just do that. Like they don't really care to get into like the specifics of it. Uh, like even like as scientific as they could have gone with Back to the Future, the flux capacitor, it's never described exactly how it works. It's just what makes time travel possible. You know, that's really it. I think the most uh, you get is like the 1.21 gigawatts uh, speech, and that's really all you ever hear about it in the entire series. You just know it but, needs power, and when it has power, it'll work. Yep. And when your car grows vroom, vroom fast enough, you go back in time or go like wherever you time travel. So that's so. the, you know, we'll, we'll call that the back to the future approach. It's a thing, it's there, it works. Yeah. Now, you, you, or we could call it the Ghostbusters approach by talking about the proton packs. Well, I was going to say the Star Trek approach of, you know, having writing writing actual field manuals for how the transporter works. And you Star know, Trek approach. Where, where every last bit of minutia is detailed. <laughs> I give you a prime example of a like of something where they never even once explain it in the original movie. They did it in that abortion that survived of a movie in 2016. They not once ever described how the proton pack even functioned. You only know that Egon was terrified of it because they never had a uh, they never even tested the equipment before using it so i mean <laughs> you know what you know what you said i didn't use a star wars example before so first i'm going to say ghostbusters is the perfect in between of you know I'm say yes but star wars you had a perfectly good thing with the force what is it yeah it's the force that's all you needed to know up until, you know, episode one came out, and then suddenly, oh, it's midi chlorians. Yeah. <laughs> Something but you know what? I can't off unexplained. But I can't take that seriously because at the time when uh, Qui Gon Jinn sent that uh, sample back to Obi Wan Kenobi, he was communicating him through the uh, handle of a Gillette razor. That's all it was. It was a handle of a Gillette razor. So I would like them to explain how that palm works. Like the little plastic handle. But uh, no, and like, you know, uh, Anna, you have a very good point. The TARDIS. How the hell is this little police call box? Josh, I wish we had that picture ready to pull up of you standing at the uh, opening of like a police call box. But um, how the hell is this, uh, you know, police call box like the TARDIS? How you walk inside and it's a spacious ass like, you know, lair for the doctor. There's no way of explaining that. They don't even try to explain it. Are you kidding? They at all. A bunch. Huh? They explain it a bunch. Well, I've never, in, my, in all fairness, I've only watched like a few episodes of Doctor Who. But the thing is, it's still, okay, so they do explain it. But, you know, it's just like it's one of those deals where it's never the whole TARDIS itself. It's never explained how the whole thing operates. Huh? Yeah, okay, now, the sonic like screwdriver, I think maybe they explain how that works. Again, I, I've, I've watched it. I got through, I think, uh, the two seasons with, uh, what's his name? The uh, Scottish guy that played Kilgrave in um, David Tennant. Mm -hmm. I got through the two seasons of uh, him. And then life just happened. I've, I've not been able to watch the rest of it since. So I've actually watched more than two episodes. I just don't remember a lot of it because it was so long ago. But, um... But no, it's like, the, it's yeah, you don't have to explain how shit works. I mean, who cares how it works? Uh, you know. And that's where a lot of these other stories go wrong. Like, you don't have to explain every single thing. But, yeah. What does this have to do with, like, world building, though? Well, people will get caught up in the idea that they can't write something because they can't explain how it works. And I was just Gotcha, saying, okay. When you're building your world, it's your rules. Oh, yeah. 
you, I you, swear, you, sometimes our conversations, it's like uh, having like uh, two Alzheimer's people talking to each other because like we're, we're trying to get to a point. But, you know, we never really get there. Or we'll lose track of where we're going. <laughs> hey, it's a conversational podcast. I know. I'm just saying, you've done it, I've done it. I think Kente did it a few times, so. <laughs> Step one, be God. <laughs> uh, is there a dominant religion? That could definitely affect how your characters behave in the world they live in. Um, how does the world affect the story? And if it doesn't affect the story, then I'm going to just say you're doing it wrong. The world has to have some sort of effect on your character. Because oh, yeah. it's what influences your character's uh, upbringing, your character's behaviors, your, your character's yep. habits. It will give them the, the ticks the nuances and the foibles that make your character realistic. Yep. So absolutely the world has to affect your yeah. character. And and there's actually a script uh you had mentioned this before. Uh one of my scripts uh Hurricane Party. Mm -hmm. The whole script takes place inside of a house because the world around this house was caught up in a you know category 4 hurricane. And it was a collection of people just sitting inside this house, stuck together with a couple that had just recently broken up a handful of like hours before this actual party started. And because of the storm locking them in this house with each other, with these other people, you know, it influenced the immediate world inside the house too, which influenced their behavior and how they conducted themselves. So, you know, and that's one thing I will say about uh, not the Tama Wiseau one, but the Brie Larson room, you know, how she conducted herself and everything else. Uh, Ryan Reynolds and buried his world around him was the desert. He was buried in a hole somewhere. But even in that box with the only line of communication being phone, the only light being lighter, and I guess the phone, uh, there was still an entire world built. You got to get a feeling of who he was, what he did, and what was going on away from him. Um, but yeah. Never quite figuring out what was going on uh, as yep. far as why things happened. So, yeah. Yeah. And uh, finally, does the physical world change or arc? Now, not every story is going to be a world changer, right? You know, as no. far as the whole world goes. But you would hope that at least a small part of your character's world is changed by what's going on in your story. Whether it's... You know, now he wears black socks as well as white socks when he used to only wear white socks. You know what? The world's changed. Why? Because he's got to go buy the other color sock. and da -da 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 -da. People are going to be surprised. And you know what? It, it affects the world around you. Because the world doesn't necessarily always mean the world. It just means your character's world. Yeah, your yeah the character's surroundings. Bear with me, my camera's uh, got some issues going on right now. Okay, um... but I'm still here. But uh, yeah, but like that's it. Like I mean, the world around the character, like it, it ha again, it's got to like the immediate surroundings is the world. What you see around this character, events happening around the character, what is affecting the character's actions, that technically itself is the world. <laughs> You know, uh, a lot of people are not familiar with uh, this movie. It's it's not a very... It's one of my favorites. Dark City. It's a sci-fi film from the 20s, uh, from the uh, 1990s. It was an amazing film, but the world was this ever-changing city. Now, I know we've actually discussed that between, like, you know, Inception. You've seen that in uh, Doctor Strange. 
-hmm. You've seen it a few times, but like this movie, the city was ever changing. And you, you saw its effects on the character. On all the characters, actually. The protagonists, the supporting characters, and the antagonists. You saw this world and how it affected these characters. But it's got to be something that the characters interact with. Where that has a direct effect on how the character grows throughout the story. Because... The good story is the character has to have some growth. Even if your character loses in the end, he has to grow. He, she, whoever, that character, your protagonist, has to grow. And the world is directly responsible in some way, shape, or form of making that happen. Yeah. Make a very good point. So. And yeah, like, uh, yeah, Annie, you're right. Ghostbusters. Walking Dead is a great example, actually. Walking Dead is a phenomenal example. <clears throat> the world of The Walking Dead. Uh, any zombie film, zombie anything, that world is a very, very good example because these characters have to adapt to this world. And most times, <clears throat> you know, outside of uh, my little thing, the characters are super stressed out. They're at their breaking points quite a few times. You know, and you see that a lot in zombie films. The Matrix. Neo, Morpheus, you know, Trinity. Like, what they deal with, with, uh, you know, the whole, like, both reality. And also, you know, inside the Matrix. You see how both worlds, and not just one or two, like, not just one world, but two worlds. How they shape these characters. So I think I think the Matrix is a, I think the Matrix is a phenomenal example. Indeed, because it takes the world you know that you know you start out in you know the world that uh, we're supposed to live in, and they flip it on its head immediately, and yeah. then you realize that. To, to go with their own um, uh, words, right? Uh, to go with their own analogy, maybe? Uh, the, the rabbit hole gets deeper. And you realize that there's yeah. yet another world. So it's a world on top of a world on top of a world. And all three are built. They set the rules in the beginning with this is the real world, this is just a guy, he's a hacker. And then they break those rules by saying, oh, and there's like some super hard well, I guess they kind of set that uh, super-ish vibe early on with uh, Trinity. But the idea is that it's, it's a world on, on top of another world. And then they take away all of the the pretty paint of the uh, yeah of the got world it working and give us the the nineties dystopia where yeah. everyone wears fishnets that was a thing yep. Yeah, absolutely. But <clears throat> we're not proud of that. <laughs> oh god. Fish nuts. Anyway. So what else we gotta cover? Do you think we probably said everything for the show that we need to say or what? I think that's that's pretty much it. Um the the the, the only thing I'll add is at the end of the day. There is one rule, one rule you absolutely must live by when you're a writer, when you're a creator. Uh, Anna touched on this in, in one of her comments. It's, you are God. You Damn right. You are the end-all, be-all of the worlds you create. You set the rules, you set the tone, you make the magic happen 
There is nothing off limits. You write whatever you want. Now, yep. keep in mind, there are some things that you write you probably shouldn't show people. <laughs> Half my shit. <laughs> Um, I wasn't going to go there, but you have read damn near every script I've ever written. How many of those do you think are actually like, you know, friendly to the modern world? Well, there's the one we're working on. <laughs> what? I said, there's what we're working on. Oh yeah. Well, well, we never actually give a teenage girl herpes though. We just make her the star of a herpes commercial. And the joke is that the agent gave her herpes. Mm-hmm. And there's so, more to it than that, but you're gonna have to watch eventually. Yeah, well, well, yeah, that's something that's going to come. Uh, that's something that we're gonna reveal soon to everybody. So, yeah, don't worry, that's coming. So, uh, remember, writers, creators, follow your own rules because nothing anybody else has matter matters. Brandon, speaking Joshua. of being a god of your own world, where can people pray to you? Well, you can worship me on uh, Instagram. You can find me at bjacksman82. That is uh, B as in boy or my name, Brandon. Uh, Brandjacksman82, J-A-X, eight M A N eight two. Uh Say you can also again. find our page huh? Say that again. The, do you, you not follow me on Instagram? I do, okay. but I don't have my Instagram pulled up. Okay. B Jacksman eighty two. So but uh yeah, so you can find me you can you can find my personal Instagram there. It is public. I have nothing to hide from you people. You don't scare me. But uh you can also find our page on Instagram, uh, The Wadcast. Uh, you'll know our page on Instagram because if you type in The Wadcast, you'll see this little black picture with a white banner in that picture with the words Wadcast in it. Same thing goes for Facebook. Uh, just go to our Facebook. And right now, it's not a little black picture with a white banner. Now it is because we are still in Gay Pride Month. We are very much still rocking the rainbow banner, but it still says Wadcast in it. Um, so go there, like, follow us, and, you know, check out our shows. You know, just come to our shows. Uh, I'm working on getting some ideas for, um, you know, some different kinds of things opposed to our pages. Uh, so those are in the works. So we have more stuff coming your way. But that's where you can find uh, me, and that's where you can find us. Now, my Facebook page, I will not give that to you. You will see me liking things on the Wadcast periodically. So if you catch my name... Send me a friend request. I may or may not accept it. I don't know. Depends. Uh, but, you know, that's where you can find me. That's where you can find us. And help us find you. Let's reach out and touch one another. In the most digital way possible. Josh, what about you? <laughs> Nothing. Um... <laughs> it's a, a little something for the uh, Facebook Live viewers. Sorry, guys, listening in the audio. Uh, you oh, can... uh, we are on Twitter. I'm sorry, Anna. We are on Twitter, but that's a Josh thing. I suck at Twitter. But Josh is on Twitter. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at SkitComic. Or uh, if you want to you know, read some tweets that don't get put up onto the podcast account because I'm not a very prolific tweeter. You can go to at Wadcast Pod or at Simicore Studios. That's uh that's the name of the big old umbrella that uh, all these podcasts fall under. So there's there's those things. I should tweet more. Maybe we should uh maybe we would get, you know, hundreds of <coughs> millions of followers. Who knows? Uh, you could always find, um, of course, the podcast and Simicro Studios on Facebook. It behooves you to like, especially the podcast 
on Facebook because that way you'll get the notifications of when we go live and be able to take part in the live chat. Yay! Uh, when when we do these shows, can you tell? Yay! Us God, it has been a long day. Uh, it I agree. Is. It usually it's is. gonna be a long night. Trust me. Anywho. Facebook, yeah. Join us for the live show every Friday night at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific uh, for the podcast. Oh, oh, and I'm not going to put up any links, but if you do feel froggy and you want to look up Semicore Studios on Patreon, I do have some tiers set up. And some of those tiers involve, you know, like being in, in, the, uh, in the old stream yard room with us while we do the show. Not on the show. That, well, that is a tier, but being in the stream yard gives you access to like a private chat and be able to take, you know, all of your questions directly, yada, yada, yada. You know, just go check it out if you feel like it, you know, maybe a buck, five bucks, whatever. I'm not going to shove it down your throat. Quick question, Josh. Uh, yeah. I just noticed this. I just looked at the screen here. Uh, before he gets sent to jail again. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> I was promoting the podcast on Insta. Such a wise ass. Yes, everyone, I'm a repeat offender on Facebook. I've been in jail, I think, 10 times now on Facebook. I'm surprised I still have an account. And Josh likes to rub it on my face. And most times... <laughs> As of late, at least, it is for something I posted, a stupid picture I've, or a meme I posted from 10 years ago. So, uh, thank you, know. Josh, for, uh, yeah, uh-huh. that's what I thought. Yeah. No, it's Brandon that needs the bail money, which you can donate through the <laughs> Patreon. No, I just, uh, I quietly spend my time and I save the link from things I need to go comment on. Don't worry. You know but either way, I've got to get out of here. I've got to get ready to go to work. So Yeah, I have to give the final message. So uh, I'm well, going to go ahead and do that it. real quick. Okay. Music's playing. Okay. And this is for something <laughs> for the audio listeners. They're the ones that hear the outro music. Um, I want to say, now that you can see me actually saying this, remember... The only thing standing between you and your dreams is you. That's right. Don't let anybody say you can't do something because you know you can. Whether it's to the you know ultra high success level of Steve Spielberg or just something that you get made and put on YouTube. If you want to create something, create it. Don't start tomorrow. Start today. Get that. Get that pen out and just start putting your ideas to paper so you can turn that paper into your future. Well, with that being said, I'm Josh. I'm Brandon. Over there. Let's do it. Is Brandon. And, uh, oh, look, and I'm hulking out. I'm hulking out right now. Look. This is actually, this white's actually, this light's actually white. It just comes off as green in the uh, filter. I don't know why, but it's like it's like the Incredible Hulk. Like, I'm Brandon. I'm Hulk. I'm angry. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'll shut up. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> oh.